Welcome and hello. This is a video lesson in EPA SWIM, and in this lesson, I'm going to be talking about the study area map. What I'm talking about here on the screen is the study area map. This is the main area of the user interface, as well as some of the topics within the map browser, the map toolbar, and then certain menu items up here that relate to the map. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. If you want to open up your EPA SWIM and follow along with me, I already have one of the example projects loaded up here on the screen. So if you wanted to go to help and then welcome screens and then click this site runoff drainage, <laughs> this is the example project that I'm working with here. As you see from this image, we already have a model that's completed and ready to run. But if we want to toggle off certain layers, we can go up to the view menu and then layers and we have them all checked on right now. That's why there's a check mark next to each of these layers. But if, for instance, we wanted to remove the backdrop map, now what we have is just the background, which I actually have already set to a green. So let me go ahead and change that back. We'll talk about the background a little bit later. I'll make it white. Okay, let's go ahead and toggle off a few other layers. So let's go view layers. And then how about we remove the links, right? The links are gone. Next, let's go ahead and go view layers. Let's toggle off the labels, view labors. Let's toggle off the nodes. So let's see, all we have left is the rain gauge and the subcatchments. So view rain gauges and subcatchments. We can toggle those off just as well. So I'm going to go ahead and add some of these layers back in. Let's just go ahead and add them all in. That's labels. And then finally, the backdrop. All right. The map browser allows us to modify the map theme. So over here in the left panel, we have the project tab for project browser and then the map tab for the map browser. And then up in this theme here, we can select a theme for the subcatchments, such as area. And now we have the different subcatchments that are identified, and they are colorized based on the value in this legend over here. Nodes also have, well, invert. And then I haven't ran the simulation yet, but after I run the simulation, we're going to see a number of additional properties that we can change the theme to. And then links are pre simulation options here or down here. I'll just go with slope. So now we have this color coded legend to represent each element and then the range of values. I can toggle these legends on and off if I go up to view and then legends, which is right here. And as you see, these are all checked on. So if I wanted to remove this link legend, I'll just uncheck it. That's one way to remove the legend. You can also just go right click. I'm sorry, that's the edit. You can just go double click to remove the legend as well. I'll, I'll add those legends back in though. Legends, node legends and link okay there's also this time legend but it's grayed out and that's because i need to run the simulation so i'll go ahead and do that i'll just click on the lightning bolt simulation is done the time legend has been loaded we have the time showing up here so i could toggle that off as well if i just wanted to click that checkbox next to legend and time we'll also toggle it back on if i wanted to modify the legend you probably saw that modify label right here so i can modify the subcatchments nodes or links so for subcatchments for instance we have this color ramp and i can edit the legend that way also you can double click i mean sorry right click yeah right click on the legend itself this is how to edit this legend for the different invert values and then the link slope values just right click all right with so many colors i'm going to actually toggle off the subcatchments and link themes. So I'll just change that right here. None. All right, I go up to none. All right. So what I'm left with is the nodes and the invert values. Also keep in mind, there's a lot more values to choose as a theme or a parameter to map the colors by now that the simulation has run. And then here's the list of nodes. The legend itself is also mobile, so I can move it around. Let me go ahead and just move it down here, for instance. Say I wanted to change the range so that it actually included a little bit more variation. One thing I could do is right click and then go auto scale. And the numbers will automatically be set to sort of span the range of values in the map. So if I click OK, now we have a variety of different colors based on their values. If I go right click and open that property box up again, we now can do, let's see, color ramp so we can change the color ramp to some different type of color that we want okay so there's that and then there's also reverse the colors if we wanted to reverse the colors and then frame that basically creates this frame here so if i toggle that off and use these new colors that's what that looks like okay i'm going to add the frame back in and if i wanted to individually change the colors here i could just do a click right here 
change the color, click OK, click a different one, change the color, click OK. Okay, so that's how that works. I'm going to click OK and then just turn that off. Next up is the map dimensions. So if we go up to the view menu and then click on dimensions, we have the map dimensions. So we could specify the lower left and upper right X and Y coordinates for this map, as well as the map units. If you click on this auto size button down here in the bottom left, this button automatically sets the dimensions based on the coordinates of the objects currently in the map. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. Okay, I think that's what it was set to originally. All right, let's go up back to view dimensions. The map unit options here is feet, meters, degrees, and none. If you happen to be using a background image, then it's recommended that you get the image properly sized before adding your elements, especially if you're using auto length on. So auto length on is down here in the status. My default, it is off, but if you switch it to on, and what that means is as you sketch in your different elements, such as the alignment of a conduit, the length, the XY location of different junctions and so on, those values will automatically be saved, not based on the default value, such as the subcatchment area or the conduit length, but based on the actual XY coordinates that are set in your map view. So if you're sketching over an existing background map, that may be a way for you to get the lengths or the locations of your objects just right. Speaking of backdrop images, if we go up to the view menu, we have this option for backdrop images, and then we can either load, unload, align, resize, watermark, or rescale. So the first thing you would do is click on load. So you know what, let me go ahead and just create a new project here, and then no. So let me go up to view, backdrop, load, and now I need to specify the file and then a optional world file as well. This first backdrop image file is required. So let me go ahead and find an image. This is a sample image here. Here's a .jpg file right here. Okay. The world coordinate file, this contains a geo-referenced information for the image itself. If I bring up the user's manual for this world coordinate file, it tells me that this is a text-based file where there's lines one through six Line one represents the real world width of a pixel in the horizontal direction. X and Y is lines two and three for the rotation parameter, and then lines four, five, and six. You can go ahead and read up on that. I'm not going to demonstrate this and or use a world fi coordinate file. If no world file is specified, then the backdrop image will be scaled to fit in the center of the map display window right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And then boom, here is my image. It's just a sub residential subdivision where you can see the streets, you can see the, the hill houses and the arterial streets as well. But the user manual also mentions if you go with backdrop, let me, let me unload that image and then backdrop load and you select this world coordinate file and then you select this scale map to backdrop image checkbox, then this will force the dimensions of the study area map to coincide with those of the background images. All existing objects will have their coordinates adjusted and to see the user's manual for additional instructions on that. Because what it describes in the user's manual is how these additional tools of align and resize are used. So let me go ahead and add my image back in. Load. Okay, here's my image. And then OK. So now I should be able to click on the backdrop and then align and resize. So align would just allow me to change that. And then if I go up to backdrop resize, I have a dialog box that allows me to change the lower left and the upper right coordinates. So I could sort of rescale the image both in the horizontal or the vertical direction. And then to scale the backdrop image to the map or vice versa. I'm going to click cancel though and just leave this as it is. Also, I can gray back the color. I can go up to view backdrop, use the watermark, will sort of dial back the image intensity, and then grayscale will change it from color to black and white. So this is what watermark looks like, for instance. It's very much grayed out and faded into the background because you're really only focusing on the objects. That's what's more, most important in the swim model, not so much the background image. All right, next up is measuring distances. So over here in the right toolbar, this is the map toolbar. There's a tool here that says um, it's like a measuring stick with a question mark. So what you want to do is click on that. And then if you want to measure the distance, just do a single left click and then do another single left click at every location that you are interested in, the different vertexes of the line. 
and then do a right click to stop. This tells me it's 12,746 feet. So to me, that's evidence that this map is too large. I could rescale it just using that sort of distance information as well. So that's how to get the distance of a line or a polyline. Also, I can get the distance and area if I happen to sketch out a polygon. And then if my last click or single right click is at the same location I started, like right there, then it's going to be going to give me the distance. It's 15,000 feet in length. That's the perimeter. And then the area here is 287.35 acres. So I'll click OK. Uh, next up is zooming and panning. So we have the pan tool over here. You can just uh, click around and pan to move the map and move the view across the different elements you have sketched in. I'm going to go ahead and bring that example project up once again. So help welcome screen and then site runoff and drainage all right so here's my program i can also zoom in and out so i click the zoom tool right here and then zoom in and then zoom in some more and then i can click the zoom out button to zoom out i can also zoom in and then click zoom extents that would show me the entire extents of the project elements these same pan and zoom tools are also available up here in the, the view menu here we have pan zoom in zoom out and zoom extents also in this same conversation is zoom or view overview. So if we have the overview map here and then we zoom in, for instance, then this overview map, I sometimes call the mini map, allows us to identify where in the overall project we are. If we're zoomed in pretty far, it could be pretty helpful. We can change our view just by panning. I also like to use the middle mouse button to pan. And then if you roll it back, you zoom out. If you roll it in, you zoom in or roll it up, you zoom in. And then um, as you may have noticed, the more we zoom in, the smaller the red rectangle gets here in the mini map. We can also reposition our location on the main map by moving this red rectangle in the mini map and vice versa. If we move in the main map, the little red rectangle in the mini map will update as well, or what's called the overview map. All right, next up for searching the map, there's two different ways to search the map. First, we can find an object based on the name. So if we wanted to go up to edit, and then click find object and then select the type of object either a catchment node or link i'll say catchment and i will search for the name s2 and then click go this is s2 let me go ahead and zoom out and then search again okay s2 is right here it tells me the junction if i happen to be searching for a link for instance let's see what's this link right here c5 okay let's pretend i don't know where it is i click c5 click go and then it also tells me the upstream and downstream junctions of that link. The button up here on the toolbar for the name search is this right here. So this is how to find an element based on its name. And then the other way to search the map is using the map query tool. That's under view and then query. This is the same dialog box. If you click on the question mark right here, it's the same thing, map query. In this situation, what you do is select a specific element type such as nodes and then the parameter, which we'll say invert. And then the criteria, either below, equal to, or above. So we'll say above, and then I'll type in, say, um, hold on a second, let me check out what some of my invert data is. So project, and then details, and then if I click on junctions, okay, I'm just looking at some of the elevations here. So I guess 4970 would probably split the, the junctions in half. So 4970, and click go. So this tells me that there's four junctions with an invert that is above 4970. If I, if I select 4975 and hit go, oh, that's too many, 4972, go. Okay, so there's two junctions with an invert above 4972. That's how that works. All right, map display options. So that's in the tools menu, map display options, right here, map display options. Now what we can do is change the appearance of the different elements in our model. So I noticed that my nodes and my links are all, both a little bit too large. So I'll change that to five. And then the links, I'll change it from nine down to four. So when I click OK, just check out the size of the nodes and the links, and they go back down to a little bit more normal size. Okay, let's go back to tools, map, display options. Also the catchment, labels, annotations, symbols, flow arrows, we wanted to um, toggle the flow arrows off and then change the background back to white. This is a little bit more of the default view. Okay, so background is white, flow arrows are gone. That's how that works. 
All right, the last thing to talk about here is the exporting the map. To do that, you can go up to File, and then Export, and then Map. Now you could save the file as a .map file, .emf file, or a .dxf. .dxf or Drawing Exchange file, this is the Autodesk Drawing Exchange format. .emf is the Windows uh, Enhanced Meta File format, and then .map here. It is the EPA SWIM's own ASCII text format. So whichever option you select, go ahead and click OK, and then specify the directory and the file name and click Save. Also, another way to save the map to your clipboard is just to click on the study area map window to make it in focus. And then you can click on the copy button right here. You can copy to the clipboard or to a file. If you copy to a file, then it would be saved as a bitmap. But if you copy to the clipboard right here and just say OK, it's now on your clipboard. It's ready to be pasted into a number of different applications that can accept a file, an image file that's on your clipboard. All right, well, that is it for this lesson. We talked about the study area map in particular with a discussion about how it interplays with the map browser, some different tools here in the map toolbars, as well as some of the different options up here in the main menu.